Hi, entrepreneurship students. So today we are continuing in our book, Fred Factor by Mark Sanborn. And uh, today we're gonna enter into the section number three or part number three, which is all about developing other Freds. And to do this, they're gonna break it down by the letter um, for Freds, the acronym Fred, and make it into individual things that we're going to delve deeper into to determine what developing a Fred will look like. So there is a little introduction, I'm gonna read that, and then today we're gonna to get into the F and the R of Fred. And we'll talk about those two things, and then your prompt this week will be due by Friday at 5 p.m., as always, along with your choice board option for the week. So that's it, let's go ahead and get started. And there are shorter chapters this week, so it won't take quite as long. Developing Other Freds, part three. Within 10 minutes of my house are two giant hardware stores that are known for their low prices. Each has an amazing selection, but the service that you receive when you shop there is pretty ordinary. That's why I rarely go to either place. Also, 10 minutes away is a smaller hardware store, probably one quarter the size of its giant rivals. While the pricing is competitive at the smaller store, I never expect for the prices to be the lowest. But I don't mind because every aisle is staffed with frets. I'm a home improvement challenged person. I'm not so much in need of parts for the sprinkler system or washers for the plumbing. I'm in the market for solutions to domestic disasters. When you walk into this smaller hardware store, highly knowledgeable and helpful staff are near the door. If they don't have the answer to your questions, they know the man or the woman who does. They don't tell you where to find the widgets and the thingamajigs, they take you to the exact spot where the stuff is. And they usually ask enough questions to find out if you're planning to buy it or what you actually really need. This retailer is an example of what happens when you populate an organization with Fred-like employees. Maybe that's one of the best kept secrets of competing successfully, having Fred-like employees at every level in your organization. So how do you get them? In an age of high employee turnover and uh, nose diving customer loyalty, developing Fred should be a critical priority for every business. Having Freds as teammates and leaders within your organization will distinguish it as a truly extraordinary company. All organizations have access to the same information, consultants, training, compensation systems, perks, and benefits. So why do some soar while others flop? The difference is not in the things, processes, functions, and structures, but it's in the people. Uninspired people rarely do inspired work. Passionate people in an organization are different. They do ordinary things extraordinarily well. Even if some of their ideas are average, they are still useful. Customers don't have relationships with organizations. They form relationships with individuals. Passionate employees, whether they are salespeople, technicians, or service reps, constantly show their commitment to customers. They do this by demonstrating their passion about what they do. As a result, Freds accomplish more than their blasé colleagues and are better able to meet the challenges of limited resources. Not surprisingly, Freds are also generally happier because there are people doing work that make them feel good and people doing exceptionally work that feel good will be exceptional. Accomplishment contributes greatly to satisfaction. How can you develop Freds? Well, the next four chapters will spell it out. Today, we're just gonna cover two. F for find, R for reward, E for educate, D for demonstrate. Simple, yes, but easy, no. But whoever said it was be easy to be, or it was easy to be extraordinary or to find and develop extraordinary people is crazy. All right, starting our chapters. The first one today, chapter eight, find. And here's our quote from Albert Hubbard. There is something that is much more scarce something finer by far, something rarer than ability. It is the ability to recognize ability. Are Freds born or made? Certainly some people are born with a predisposition to be Fred-like. Others may not start out with that orientation, but in time they learn how to be that way. Still, others may leverage their natural disposition with a deliberate effort to be even more Fred-like. In any case, the more Freds you attract to your organization or team, the more successful you'll be. Before I explain how to help people be more Fred-like, let's look at some ways to find Freds who are already out there. There are three basic ways to seek out Freds, both inside and outside your organization. Number one, let them find you. Is your organization a Fred magnet? 
If you really want a company to be world-class, it must become the kind of place that attracts Freds. According to Dale Doughton, author of The Gifted Boss, people want to work in organizations for bosses who offer them a chance and a chance. Sorry, a change and a chance. The change is the opportunity to work for an organization that recognizes, rewards, encourages, and values Freds. The chance is to become better than one has ever been. These are the factors that most Freds want and seek. But here's the catch. If you don't already have some living, breathing Freds doing exceptional things for your customers and your clients, your place of business or organization isn't going to be perceived as the hot place to work. If your employees and colleagues don't go home at the end of the day and rave to family and friends about what a great company they work for, don't count on word of mouth to bring in your landslide of Fred-like applicants. Sometimes you can acquire exceptional people from other departments in your organization. They may be feeling restrained by their current boss or situation and are looking for a place to grow and show, to develop their abilities and demonstrate what they're capable of doing. Make your area a Fred oasis. Really good department heads have often told me that they got their best team players from other departments where they weren't being taken care of. Another way, number two, discover dormant Freds. Finding Freds is often no more difficult than uncovering the latent talent of those that you already work with. Remember, when downsizing was so prevalent, certainly some of it was necessary, but I've always felt that much of it was a quick fix. Managers believed it was easier to let employees go than to release their talents and their abilities. What would have happened if managers would have taken the time to uncover the hidden contributions that employees could have made to justify their place in the organization? Many employees are loaded for making the ordinary extraordinary, but nobody has figured out how, figuratively speaking, to pull the trigger. Discovering talent is often nothing more than undiscovering it or uncovering it. When you trust your people with time, the most valuable asset to reveal their talents, you'll see just how many friends there already are in your organization. Are there any uh, tricks or techniques for spotting potential friends? In theory, at least, everyone has the potential to make the ordinary extraordinary, but the kind of person that I'm referring to here is already inclined to do so. The most practical suggestion that I can give you is to pay attention. Watch for people who do things with flair, not to be confused with showing off or trying to attract attention, an exceptionally well done project, an elegant client meeting, or a clever suggestion are all possible tip offs for a doormat Fred that is standing right before your very eyes. Number three, you can hire Freds. When you have exhausted the potential Fred pool in your own backyard, then what you need to do to identify a potential Fred is know how to see it in an interview. Here's what you should ask a prospective Fred. Who are your heroes and why? Why would anyone do more than necessary? Tell me three things that you think would delight most customers, clients, and consumers. What's the coolest thing that happened to you as a customer? What is service? Here are some questions to ask yourself about a potential Fred. What do I remember most about this person? What's the most extraordinary thing that he or she has ever done? How badly would this person be missed if he or she left her current position? These are really great questions. In fact, I'm actually gonna be part of the interview team here soon uh, for our new AD slash assistant principal. So I may be asking some of these questions. Build your Fred team. What would you consider best? An ordinary team led by a Fred or a team of Freds led by an ordinary leader? Okay, it's kind of a trick question. The answer for me at least is none of the above. But I want a team of Freds led by a Fred. Only when leaders and followers share the same values and commitment can any organization truly maximize the potential of the Fred factor. There are lots of people like Fred out there in the marketplace. The challenge is finding them. The solution is to discover them, attract them, and hire them. All three involve slightly different strategies, but each complements each other. And over time, you can build a winning team of Freds. So that's the find. Okay, now on to our next chapter. Chapter nine, reward. We've gone through the F of find, and now we're on to reward. So here's our quote from Andrew Carnegie. No man can become rich without himself enriching others. 
Dr. Michael LaFoe, in his insightful book, The Greatest Management Principle in the World, sums it up quite neatly when he tells us that we don't get the behavior that we hope for, beg for, or demand. We get the behavior that we reward. Dr. LaFoe also explains more fully that it is a matter of rewarding the right behavior and using the right rewards. Following are some examples of how this works. The Atlanta Bus Boy. This instructive and touching story was related to me by Jim Car Cathcart, author of Acorn Principle and the CEO of Cathcart Institute Incorporated. A few, a few years ago, I was traveling through the airport in Atlanta, Georgia. At the food court between concourses, I stopped for breakfast snack only to be confronted by a thousand of fellow travelers also stopping to eat there. The place was packed. Every table had people standing nearby waiting to take over seats on a moment's notice. As I stood sipping my coffee and eating a muffin, I noticed a busboy cleaning the tables. He was sadly slumped over and looked defeated and depressed. He dragged himself slowly from table to table, clearing off the trash, wiping off the tabletops, and he made eye contact with no one. And just watching him, I started to become depressed. I caught myself mid-emotion and said to myself, somebody has to do something about this. So I did. I disposed of my trash and walked over to the busboy. I tapped him on the shoulder, which made him recoil as if he had been caught in a crime. What are you doing here? That is, uh, sorry, what you are doing here sure is important, I said. Huh? He replied. I repeated myself and added, if you weren't doing what you are doing, it wouldn't be five minutes before there was trash everywhere and people would stop coming in here. But what you are doing is important and I just wanted to say thanks for doing it. And then I walked away. He was in shock. Perhaps no one had ever spoken to him in that way before. When I had walked about 10 feet, I turned and looked back at him, and in the time that it had taken for me to travel just that distance, I swear he had grown six inches. He was standing straighter, almost smiling, and even looking some people in the eye. Now he had not become a serviceman, spreading cheer and goodwill. That was merely working a bit more effectively, and no, sorry, he was merely working a bit more effectively and no longer looking depressed. What I had done in the overall scheme of things was trivial. My comments did not change the world, or did they? By simply pointing out how the busboy's behavior affected other people, I had added dignity to his worth. My simple acknowledgement of his worth had raised his opinion of himself in that role. I love Jim's story, who by the way, is quite a friend himself in this incident, but it illustrates a key principle. When you don't see much meaning in what you do, you won't bring much value to what you do. Jim helped that busboy to see the bigger picture of his importance, and that wasn't all. In the course of the workday, the busboy probably came into contact with hundreds of people, all of whom were traveling somewhere to interact with still more people. No doubt, some of the busboy's heightened sense of self-worth infected the people around him, and those good vibes radiated to others in distant locations. And that's what happens when the Fred Factor is fully operative. Even the smallest gestures make the world a better place. Intention counts too. It's just as important to reward a Fred for good intentions as for stellar outcomes. While no one likes to fail, it is much more important for an employee to know that taking chances to do the right thing will be acknowledged, not punished. Nobody hits a home run every time. In fact, home run hitters tend to strike out more than other batters. When people feel that their contributions are unappreciated, they will stop trying. And then when that happens, innovation dies. Implement your reward strategy. Take a good look around your organization or the areas where you have influence. Rewarding others is not that hard to do. This is all you have to do on a consistent basis. Make sure all of your team members know that they are making an important contribution or have the ability to do so. Tell your team members what kind of difference they are making. Be specific. Cite increased production, sales, hires, commendations from outside sources, insightful suggestions, increased motivation and enthusiasm, anything and everything that applies. Be sure that positive feedback about their efforts is a rule, not an exception. Create an award. Consider a trophy or a plaque or even a small amount of cash. Don't make the value of the award so large that in monetary terms that it looks like a Fred bribe. Have fun sharing tangible recognition. Consider giving multiple Fred awards each month if several people are deserving. Get the leader, CEO, president, director, or whoever of your organization to personally recognize the Freds. 
ask him or her to send a note or to make a phone call letting the employee know that their contribution has been noticed and appreciated. Remember the reward formula and apply it often. Recognize a contribution, reinforce its positive effects on your business, and repeat. And don't forget that sincere praise for trying, written as well as spoken frequently in public and in private, is one of the best rewards. So there you have it, folks. There are the ways to find and reward a Fred. Don't forget, you have to do your Fred prompt this week for week five. And then you also have your uh, choice board option where you need to choose at least two things. So those are your two assignments for the week. They are both due by Friday. Other than that, have a great week. And if you need anything, please, 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 please reach out. You can either email me or you can contact me using my Google voice number. All right, have a great week, guys.